I'm very happy to see uh, all of you uh, this evening. And I'm quite impressed that uh, you're able to come uh, you know, at this time, at 6 p.m. Uh, in the evening, because normally uh, we don't schedule any seminar or, or, or lecture after like 5, OK? So uh, this shows your uh, interest and enthusiasm uh, for learning. So uh, today, uh, my topic uh, is about uh, North Korea. And I'm sure you uh, read about this country uh, in the paper or in a watch on TV. But still, uh, not many people really know uh, about this country, uh, its a people, uh, its a society, or what, what's going on. Uh, some years ago, uh, I had a research project uh, to analyze uh, American media coverage of Korean in the peninsula. Okay, so uh, we coded about you know, 5,000 articles uh, from okay, three major uh, American papers, uh, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and uh, Washington Post. And from like 1994 uh, for about 20 years. Okay, so, so among uh, Korean issues, uh, can you guess uh, what is a single item that has received most attention uh, in the American media? Nuclear? nuclear? Yeah, nuclear weapons, yeah. So, well, you know, WMD, you know, weapons of uh, mass uh, destruction. Do you know how, 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 what's the proportion? It's in my book, but... Uh, I mean, about the whole Korean issue, North and South. Huh? Uh, it's a little too much, but about, about 30%. Okay, 30% of all the articles in three main, you know, three main papers are about you know, weapons of mass destruction uh, from North Korea. So you know, it's very important because uh, you know, that kind of coverage you know, shapes uh, American perception right, or understanding uh, of the country. So, so when people think about uh, North Korea, you know, you know nuclear weapons uh, comes, comes to their mind, right? But still, uh, North Korea is a country, right? You know, it has you know, 20 million people, right? You know, still they marry, right? Still they dine and wine, right? Still they dance and sing, right? So still, I mean, still it's a human society, and we really have to understand uh, what that is and uh, what's happening. So, so what is North Korea? Uh, do you know what is the official name of, of this country? Because oftentimes we refer to like, you know, North Korea, right? But uh, uh, it was established uh, from uh, 1948. But then a uh, more you know, you know, you know, challenging question is the, what that is. Okay, that's the official name. Uh, so you know, in the beginning, uh, certainly in you know, the Soviet Union and, and China uh, had a big influence on North Korea. So here I'm going to show some. I don't want to block. So here, do you know this guy? Stalin, right? This one, Kim Il Sung, uh, the, the the first leader of North Korea, and Mao. Okay, good. So. You know, certainly, uh, Soviet and, and China had big influence uh, in the beginning of North Korean uh, regime. And this one uh, is uh, you know, economic uh, development plans uh, in, in North Korea. <clears throat> you know, this is basically uh, modeled after the Chinese uh, Great Leapfrog Movement, uh, which ended uh, as a disaster. But uh, now the question is whether it is still communist. I mean, it was. And if you look at uh, North Korean constitution, uh, it is not anymore. They deleted any reference to communism uh, many years ago. So officially, it is not a communist country. And they don't have communist party either. So like China still has, right? See, CCP, right? Chinese Communist Party. 
But uh, North Korean, they don't call uh, their you know, ruling party not as communist, but as like you know, workers' party. So, uh, I mean, we can debate, but I think you know, North Korea uh, wanted to be away from being communist. Okay. Now, what it is, right? So, second one is whether it's a dynasty. Okay. Uh, we know that. There are you know, three generations of you know, succession. So, the grandfather, right? Uh, Kim Il sung. So, he gave power to his son, Kim Jong il, uh, who died about two years ago. And now he gave power to uh, his son, Kim Jong un. He's now like late 20s, right? So, uh, if you look at uh, you know, power succession, it just looks like. Uh, like Joseon dynasty or you know, any other uh, dynasty. So some people you know, outside of North Korea are asking you know, how you could give you know, power to your son. Right? And in, in any democratic uh, modern society, you just cannot right, give power to your uh, family member. Right? But uh, in, in North Korean system, uh, it is quite uh, you know, unusual, okay? I think uh, most North Korean people accept that as quite legitimate and quite natural. So in, in that sense, you might say that North Korea is like the you know, Kim uh, dynasty. I'll come back to uh, this issue uh, toward the end. But uh, so in, in that sense, it's a partly uh, in a dynasty. A third one uh, we can ask, uh, whether uh, North Korea is also nationalist, because uh, North Korea promotes you know, very strong uh, nationalism. So Chuche, uh, they are promoting uh, this idea of Korean nation as number one. So uh, if you read you know, Bible, right? Like uh, you know, Jewish people are chosen people by God, right? So North Korea is promoting a similar idea that you know, Korean people were chosen to lead the world. So they are very much uh, uh, nationalistic uh, in their ideology, in their teaching, and in education. Finally, uh, you could say uh, whether it's a militaristic. Okay, uh, you know, earlier, uh, we talked about uh, that uh, North Korea has nuclear weapons and a lot of people outside associate North Korea with uh, WMD. And actually, uh, during uh, Kim Jong-il, uh, you know, in the era, uh, he was promoting this military first you know, policy. Okay, so uh, typically, uh, in a communist system, including China today, so who's the main uh, power agency uh, in, in, in the state? Who's the main power holder? Do you know? Let's say like China. Who has the main power? Government, party, what? military, party, right? So in, 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 a, in a very typical uh, communist system, the party uh, is a source of power. And party oversees military, uh, and also you know, government basically reports to uh, you know, the party. So if you look at China, uh, the foreign minister doesn't have a, you know, real power in foreign policy making. So who has a real power? A member of the standing committee of CCP, right? So. But then uh, during Kim Jong-il uh, era, uh, he pursued a military force policy. So the main title of Mr. Kim was a chairman of defense commission of the, of the, of, of the party, right? Uh, as Professor Peng mentioned, <clears throat> I was in uh, you know, northeastern part of China about two weeks ago. Uh, I went to you know, Dandong. Uh, Dandong is uh, uh, you know, the, the city in, in China you know, overlooking uh, North Korea. There's a big uh, uplock you know, river, and then uh, there's Dandong. 
as, you, know, you can see in you know, North Korea, I think there's one photo that I'm going to show you. And then in, in Bandong, uh, I went to a uh, North Korean uh, restaurant. And I think now there are about you know, 50 uh, North Koreans that are working in China uh, as uh, you know, legal workers. And I'm not talking about refugees, but about 50,000 uh, North Koreans are estimated to be working uh, in China. So <clears throat> I went to uh, this North Korean uh, restaurant and there was a very you know, pretty uh, North Korean waitress. Okay, I think she said she's about 24 years old. And then, you know, it's not easy to you know, work in China. You really have to be a good you know, family background in order to come out to China uh, to work. So we are you know, having some talks and, and so on. And I, I asked her, or one of our members asked, uh, you know, you know, who sh does she wants to, want to marry you know, as a husband? You know, who will be ideal in a husband? Do you know what, what's her answer? Like occupation. Just guess. Military. Yeah, military, right? The soldiers. But uh, when I mentioned this one to other people uh, in the states, uh, one person made a very interesting you know, comment saying that uh, that's because the military uh, is engaged in a lot of illegal activities or business. So that uh, actually they can make quite a money. <laughs> But anyway, uh, my point here is that uh, they've been promoting uh, the status of military uh, in the Russian society in, in 1990s and, and 2000. Okay, now let me uh, shift into inter-Korean relations. So I think in you know, the Koreans, uh, both North and South, uh, they have very strong uh, in a sense of ethnic homogeneity. So, you know, when we are in school, uh, we've been uh, taught that uh, Koreans, uh, sh you know, share the same blood, right, same ancestor. We all belong to the uh, same nation, right? So very strong uh, ethnic uh, nationalism. But then uh, the reality <coughs> is that uh, Korea was uh, divided uh, into two parts, right? Uh, in 1945, okay, North and South, and then the nation still remains uh, you know, divided. So, you know, that situation uh, created, you know, very, uh, I think, important question. You know, who's going to uh, represent, you know, whole Korean nation or national community, right? Because it's like, you know, one family, big family, right? But it's broken into two parts, right? And then who's going to represent uh, the whole nation? So the both North and South have been uh, struggling to represent uh, the entire uh, Korean you know, ethnic national community uh, over many decades. And in, in that sense, uh, you know, Korean War, uh, which was highly destructive, uh, one maybe out of every to families, right? You know, war killed uh, during Korean War. It's you know, highly uh, destructive. And I think uh, maybe uh, hundreds of thousand Chinese were killed. Uh, I think about maybe 70, 80,000 uh, American soldiers were killed as well. So it was a really destructive war. But anyway, uh, I think the North wanted to uh, unify, right? Uh, uh, that uh, in a Korean uh, nation. And I mean, this is uh, you know, very different uh, from Germany because you know, Germany was also divided after 1945, but there's no war, right? And between East and, you know, in a, East and, in Western Germany. But in Korean case, the three year war that was highly destructive. And then after war, uh, there's a lot of ideological propaganda on both sides. Uh, in the South, uh, they're promoting and, and educating uh, to their children uh, anti-communism. So like, uh, you know, communists are a bunch of, you know, horned puppets. So when I was, uh, you know, in, in like uh, elementary school and middle school uh, in the South, you know, we thought uh, those Koreans were not human beings, right? Some kind of monsters, right? But that's an image of North Korea 
uh, in the south. Similarly, uh, in the north, uh, they are promoting anti-Americanism. And here you can see <clears throat> South Korea is a poverty-stricken land where American soldiers shoot Korean children, right? So I have some uh, you know, pictures. So do you know what this is about? I still remember you know, those, those, those moments. It's a pira. It's like you know, a leaflet. Okay, so, so North Koreans would send uh, those like, uh, into like mountains and uh, areas in the south. I mean, right now, actually, uh, South Korea is uh, sending certain big you know, balloon to North Korea with this leaflet. But this one uh, contains a lot of North Korean uh, propaganda, right? So you know, when I was in elementary school, uh, if we pick uh, that leaflet from the north and bring to like, your teacher or classroom, then I, I think you got a little reward. I forgot what. It's like either extra credit or something. But uh, the propaganda from the north was very intense. You know, they are uh, you know, spreading those you know, leaflets into uh, an area in the south. And here, like, uh, you know, this is South Korean soldier, this is North Korean, right? And then this is a statue of like a very young uh, Korean, uh, South Korean boy who was killed by uh, South Korea, I mean, by North Korean spies. Uh, Lee Seung Bok, maybe you're maybe too young to remember, but, but here <coughs> uh, in, 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 in school, you know, what they are teaching was that you know, he was uh, threatened and eventually killed by North Korean spies. But even at the moment of his death, he was saying, you know, I hate you know, communists. And then he was killed. So, so that uh, here the idea is that, you know, you, know, you or you know, I, you know, young, young South Korean people, you know, uh, you know, you know have to fight you know, communists uh, to death, right? So, I mean, you know, looking back, you know, when I got much older, I thought that's a very inhumane you know, education. I think about like a uh, you know, 10-year-old boy. You know, he was threatened, right, by let's say North Korean spies, and I don't know, if you are then please help me, right? <laughs> please save my life, right? Not like, you know, you know I hate communists. But anyway, it's a very intense uh, propaganda uh, in South. But same thing uh, in North Korea. They are glorifying uh, their leader, the great leader. And like uh, Kim Jong-il, you know, looks like a you know, very uh, benevolent leader, right? Uh, you know, feeding uh, his people, you know, and so on. And oops, this is uh, the last one, Kim Jong-un. So if you look at uh, you know, his appearance, you know, he's more like grandfather than father, right? And then, uh, you know, Kim Il Sung, uh, I think, you know, made his name as a fighter, you know, guerrilla fighter against Japanese. So that I think this is some kind of image of like, you know, in a fighter. I think so. Uh, they are trying to create the image of this young leader as like uh, his uh, grandfather. So, but that, that's that's only my my own view. Okay, so regarding uh, inter-Korea relations, <clears throat> you know, after the collapse of the uh, Soviet Empire uh, in late 80s and early 90s, there's a lot of change uh, in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, that began with uh, you know, the old politic uh, by No uh, in, in early 1990s. So basically, uh, the Noteo government uh, normalized relations with China and uh, Soviet Union, you know, later Russia. So I think that was uh, in a big, big uh, you know, change uh, in the Korean Peninsula because you know, Soviets and Chinese, okay, they fought uh, in the Korean War to help uh, North Korea. And you know, Americans, of course, you know, you know, fought uh, for South Korea. So now South Korea was normalizing uh, relations with you know, two formal enemies uh, in early 1990s. 
And then uh, in uh, late 1990s, uh, President Kim Dae-jung uh, was pursuing uh, sunshine policy. So basically, uh, he said that you know, we are not seeking any collapse of the North, but trying to uh, preserve you know, peace on the Korean Peninsula, and then you know, separate you know, politics uh, from business. So in, in 2000, uh, Mr. Kim uh, you know, met with uh, Kim Jong-il. It was the first uh, summit uh, between two Korean leaders uh, after 1945, when uh, Korea was uh, divided. And then there's a lot of uh, you know, hopes and expectation uh, to improve uh, inter-Korea relations. So one is like uh, uh, Mount Kumgang project. So Mount Kumgang uh, is on like uh, the eastern part of uh, you know, Korean Peninsula. It's known as you know most beautiful mountain uh, in Korea, and then North Korea opened uh, this area for South Korean uh, tourists, and then they even also had a special uh, economic zone uh, in Kaesong. Kaesong also in the middle, but on the, in the western part of uh, Korean Peninsula. So this is uh, in, in, in a factories uh, in the Kaesong uh, in a complex. So. I think uh, during uh, Kim Dae-jung and Dong-hyun government, uh, from late uh, 90s for 10 years, there's a lot of uh, development uh, between uh, the two Koreas. But then uh, after uh, North Korea uh, you know, went uh, nuclear, and then after South Korea uh, had a conservative government, uh, inter-Korean relationship, uh, you know, began to change again. So, and as you know, uh, North Korea tested a uh, nuclear device uh, three times already, right? And they did, uh, you know, many uh, missile tests. And I'll come back to uh, that issue later. But anyway, uh, South Korean uh, conservative government responded by very tough you know, policy. So, so like Lee myung uh, government saying that unless uh, you, like North Korea, uh, give up a uh, nuclear weapon, you know, we're not going to give you any like, you know, big uh, economic aid and so on. And North Korea responded uh, by provoking uh, some you know, military actions. So like uh, one uh, South Korean civilian was killed uh, by a North Korean soldier at Mount Gumgang. I mean, she was a tourist and they basically closed uh, this Mount Gumgang project. And then a year later, there was torpedo attack on Cheonan, uh, you know, South Korean uh, in a battleship uh, here, and also a shelling of Yeonpyeong Island. So, you know, towards uh, like, like, you know, 2010, 20, uh, you know, 11, there's a lot of tensions uh, on the Korean Peninsula. And actually, uh, some people uh, in the United States, they were quite concerned that there might be another war on the Korean Peninsula, even though I never believed that uh, it was going to happen. So at the time, you know, I was going to you know, South Korea, and then some people saying, you sure you, you, are, you, know, you want to go to you know, uh, you know, visit uh, South Korea because of all those tensions. And now we have a new government uh, led by uh, Park Geun-hye, the first uh, female president of South Korea. And as you know, uh, she is daughter of the late president Park Jong-hee. And she's now uh, pursuing what, what uh, she calls trust uh, process, or trust building process uh, on the Korean uh, Peninsula. So they have certain components like uh, she's trying to separate uh, security from dialogue. So on the one hand, she's emphasizing you know, very strong uh, military deterrence, but at the same time, uh, open to dialogue uh, with North Korea, and also trying to uh, get international uh, cooperation. So, 
So in the Madame Park, uh, went to Washington uh, for a summit with uh, Miss Obama uh, in May. And then in late June, uh, she went to China to meet with uh, you know, new Chinese leader, uh, Xi Jinping. And I think you know, her visit to uh, you know, China was quite uh, important because okay, until then, a okay, new South Korean president uh, will visit uh, Washington first. Then do you know what the second visit, the summit? I mean, usually, you know, Washington was the second important country for South Korea. U.S. and no idea. Japan. Yeah, Japan, Tokyo, right? And then Beijing, right? But this time uh, she went to Washington, and then Beijing. She hasn't yet uh, gone to you know, Tokyo. I mean, now uh, uh, relationship between uh, South Korea and uh, Japan uh, is not going very well. But at the same time. Uh, Xi Jinping uh, invited you know, Park Geun-hye before Kim Jong-un. Okay, that's just something very unusual. I mean, normally, right, uh, North Korean leader uh, visit to Beijing, just like South Korean leader visit uh, you know, Washington. So Kim Jong-un is almost now almost two years in power. He still has to visit you know, Beijing you know, to meet with a uh, new Chinese leader. So and there's something you know, really interesting happening uh, right now, I mean, at least I mean, that's one good uh, indication. But if you look at uh, inside the South, there's very strong uh, identity politics. There's a very strong tension now between conservatives and progressive. I mean, now there's a tension between North and South, but also within South, uh, Korean progressives and conservatives are really debating uh, about uh, you know, you know, policy and attitude uh, to North Korea. But I think in, Korea, in South Korea, okay, you know, important criteria to be conservative is like, you know, pro-alliance with the United States and very anti-North Korea. And if you're progressive, you're more critical of the alliance, more sympathetic to uh, North Korea. So that, that's a very important uh, criteria to make you like, conservative or progressive uh, in South Korea. So, you know, this is my book. Uh, I mentioned about uh, analyzing, you know, 5,000 uh, in articles in, in, in uh, U.S. media. Also, I look at about 3,000 articles uh, in the South, I mean, in South Korea. So, you know, here's one example about, like, you know, frame analysis. Uh, so, Joseon is a very conservative paper. And Hangyare is very uh, liberal or progressive paper uh, in South Korea. I mean, their view is very different. Like here, like conservatives believe that uh, DPLK is a threat to ROK or East Asia. But very little uh, in article you can find in the frame uh, in, in liberal paper. But on the other hand, let's say like uh, you know, US is responsible you know, about you know, DPLK. And you know, you have many frames uh, from progressive paper, but nothing uh, from uh, conservative. So now, very intense uh, tensions uh, between conservatives and progressives uh, in South Korea right now, even today, even right now. And I think that's uh, in a big factor uh, that uh, we have to consider uh, in. Uh, understanding South Korean policy uh, toward North Korea. And one question that uh, people, especially in the South, are asking is whether unification is necessary or even feasible. So in my view, uh, unification is a politically correct issue uh, for most South Korean people. Because they believe that you know, we all belong to the same nation, uh, they also saying that you know, we have to be reunified. Okay? So if you deny that proposition, that you're anti-Korean or anti-national. So it's a like, uh, you know, politically correct issue. So publicly, most people still say that 
you know, all, you know, we Koreans have to be uh, reunified. However, and then also in 1990s, after uh, German unification, there's a lot of, you know, hope that, uh, you know, Korea will be uh, reunified as well. But now, about 20 years after the German unification, uh, I think South Korean people began to change, especially among, uh, you know, young generation. So if you talk to, you know, people like you know, privately, you know, over drink, or if you talk to, you know, young people like high school or college, okay, a lot of people saying that, you know, I don't really, you know, want unification because they're concerned that uh, unification might, you know, create, you know, more problems uh, for their life. So a growing number of young people in South Korea question the necessity of unification. So I'll give you some like uh, survey data. So this one, the question about whether unification is uh, necessary uh, for Korea. Like uh, in 2007, almost two thirds, but now it's slightly over half. You can see a gradual decline. And then those are saying not necessary and has been increasing uh, over the years. And also in terms of timing uh, of unification, you know, you can see that a lot of people are saying that you know, we like to keep uh, the status quo. So you know, still, you know, about 10% of, of, of people saying that you know, we have to unify as as possible. But then uh, those categories like uh, keep the status quo or maybe you know, wait until things get ready, uh, that portion uh, you know, you know, you know, change it uh, over the years. Okay, so now let me turn to uh, North Korean foreign policy, uh, maybe you know, quickly. So as I said, you know, earlier, you know, Stalin uh, and Soviet uh, you know, policy had an influence on uh, North Korea, especially uh, in consolidating uh, Kim Il Sung's power. I mean, there's a lot of debates about, you know, who this person was, because uh, in North Korean uh, propaganda, you know, Kim Il-sung was a real hero, right? defeating you know, tens of Japanese you know, you know, troops and so on. But uh, in, in South Korean propaganda, you know, he was like a puppet you know, by uh, Soviet. But I think uh, what's uh, maybe close to the truth is that, I mean, he was, I mean, he was a guerrilla leader, maybe leading maybe six, seven uh, hundred people. Maybe he may have scored you know, a few victories over uh, Japan. So that's why he made his name. So he was quite popular by 1945, but still he was very young, just like uh, his grandson uh, today. But then the Soviet uh, supported uh, Kim Il-sung because uh, you know, during uh, you know war years, uh, he went to Russia, and it's not clear what he has done in Russia at the time. But certainly, he came to know uh, you know Soviet uh, leaders at the time. But then, you know, during 1960s, when there was tension between China and Soviet, uh, North Korea really maintained you know, a very fine line. Okay, maintaining sort of uh, equal distance uh, from both China and, and Soviet. So I think a lot of people are saying that uh, maybe you know, North Korea should get credit uh, in maintaining such a balanced uh, relationship with uh, both powers because you know, Soviet and China were you know, big uh, allies for uh, North Korea, but they're having you know, a lot of troubles, right? But then they were able to maintain uh, good balance of you know, power uh, you know, approach at the time. But I think after the collapse of the uh, you know, Soviet, Soviet Empire, uh, Russian influence on North Korea has declined substantially. And I don't think uh, Russia has that much influence on North Korea uh, anymore. 
But if still, you know, if there's any country that has most influence on North Korea is China. China, uh, I think, uh, can claim that they have uh, very special uh, ties uh, with uh, North Korea. Initially, you know, Stalin uh, supported uh, Kim Il-sung's attack uh, on the South in 1950. But in the end, it, it wasn't really Soviets, but Chinese who really fought uh, to the end to defend uh, North Korea. Uh, you may remember that uh, Chairman Mao's you know, son, you know, he was killed, actually, uh, during fight uh, in, in, in the Korean War, actually. So, you know, when I you know, went to you know, China and talking to some experts and policymaking people, I think what they are saying to us is that you know, just as you know, South Korea maintains a special alliance uh, relationship with the United States, you know, they're saying that you know, we should recognize that China has some special ties with North Korea uh, historically. So, I mean, economically now, you know, South Korea is much more important uh, for China today, but still from historical and strategic perspective, uh, North Korea remains very important uh, for uh, North Korea. So uh, this is a summit between uh, Kim Il-sung and Zhang Zemin. And now about two thirds of North Korean trade uh, is with uh, China, right? So uh, as I mentioned, okay, this is me uh, two weeks ago. <laughs> so this is from China side, this is North Korea, this part. And then there are two bridges. Okay, one is that was uh, you know, destroyed uh, during uh, Korean War, it's uh, exactly half, halfway. Uh, so, you know, Americans uh, bombed the bridge so that uh, Chinese couldn't come to uh, Korean Peninsula. And then the next one, they built a new one. But anyway, now in, in, in that area, there's a lot of, uh, you know, trade between China and North Korea. I mean, here, I think, little puzzle, I mean, which I had as well, is that, you know, these days, uh, you, know, you know, if you talk to uh, you know, people who visited North Korea, okay, they are saying that uh, North Korean economy is not that bad. I mean, it's not great, but then compared to, let's say, five years ago, it's uh, maybe even slightly better. Okay, now the question is then, you know, why? Because now, you know, after North Korean testing of nuclear device, there's a UN sanctions, right? I mean, that China, Supported, I mean, even you know, early this year, and South Korean support or aid to North Korea has cut substantially, right? So, despite those uh, external environments, how North Korean economy is still alive and doing relatively well. I mean, so I think the main I think factor is that the trade, okay, between North Korea and uh, the North is some part of China, okay, because they are very small trade, okay, not big one, and then those, are, those small trade are not affected by UN sanctions. So I had a lunch with some uh, Chinese uh, businessmen uh, who are doing business uh, in North Korea, and one person uh, said that, uh, you know, we had a lunch with, you know, with them in, in, in his hotel, actually, it's a nice restaurant, and overlooking uh, this river, and then you know we had almost like maybe ten different dishes of seafood, including sashimi, and he's saying that it all came from North Korea. So they are saying that it's not polluted, it's very clean, <laughs> it's very natural. So anyway, I think economically, uh, North Korea is getting more and more dependent on on China, and you know I can see that you know very clearly. Uh, during my visit to the area uh, two weeks ago. But still, I mean, that, that's also a very important point because, you know, North Korea needs China for their, you know, economic, uh, uh, you know, situation. And also they need China for security. And China also, 
uh, still needs North Korea for strategic uh, reason. So that's why uh, China wouldn't give up North Korea anytime soon. And North Korea still uh, needs support from China. But nonetheless, you know, if you talk to North Koreans or Chinese, you know, they don't like each other. <laughs> right? So if you talk to you know, Chinese, ah, North Koreans, they are terrible. You know? If you talk to North Koreans, they are saying, you, know, you cannot trust Chinese. So I think that's a very important point. I don't think, uh, I think that's an you know, important uh, truth because uh, that's one reason you know, why North Korea wants to normalize relations with the United States because they are also getting concerned that they are you know, more and more dependent on China. And they remember 1960s when China and, and Soviet were having tensions. So, I think they don't want to be too dependent on China. Right now, there's no other choice. That's why uh, you know, more and more trade with China. But if possible, North Korea wants to have a certain balance of power uh, against China. And that's one reason, you know, if not the only one, what you know, they like to normalize relations with the uh, United States. And I had uh, several opportunities to have uh, like, you know, private meetings with uh, North Korean uh, top officials, and they actually uh, indicate uh, the interest. And I mean, normally, you know, we do in English, but uh, like, you know, over dinner, over drink, I just speak to them in Korean, and then they sometimes uh, say quite frankly. So as I just said, uh, you know, North Koreans, uh, you know, strong propaganda uh, of like, anti-Americanism. And they certainly are uh, trying to use uh, nuclear cards to attain a normalized relationship with the United States for both uh, security uh, and economy. And you know, as you know, there's been a very strong uh, sort of you know, you know, distrust of uh, DPRK uh, in, in Washington. I think either you are uh, Republican or Democratic, you know, they don't you know, trust uh, North Korea. And you know, here you can you know, debate you know, why North Korea wants nuclear weapons. You know, one is certainly you know, security because uh, you know, South Korea has a much stronger military power uh, in terms of conventional uh, military. So by having a uh, nuclear weapon, maybe they can neutralize uh, their weakness in conventional uh, military. And, or, or maybe you could say that they like to negotiate to gain more economic assistance uh, from international community. Or I think now this is becoming more and more important that they, that's important for your internal uh, political reason because now, you know, if you become a nuclear state, uh, it, it, it means something in international community, and then political leaders uh, can use to, uh, you know, I mean, use that as a propaganda uh, for their regime. And you know, we know there are two nuclear crises, and the first time there was a uh, you know, bilateral negotiation between U.S. and DPRK, which was broken in, in later. And then uh, during the current uh, crisis, uh, we had six party talks uh, led by China. But you know, we haven't had any six party talk for the last five years. And I don't think uh, things will change uh, anytime soon because uh, I think yesterday, uh, Steve Bosworth and Gallucci, they were former. Uh, American negotiators for uh, North Korea on nuclear issue. I mean, they're saying that now we have to talk to North Korea. I mean, but they are urging for dialogue. But that's still the main mood in Washington is that, you know, you don't want to buy the same horse you know, twice or third time. I mean, that, that's the feeling uh, in Washington. So unless uh, North Korea shows real intent or even certain action to give up nuclear weapon, uh, Americans are very hesitant 
uh, to come back to the table uh, for negotiation. So uh, I think North Korea has become de facto uh, nuclear state. Now more and more sanctions uh, by US, by UN and South Korea. And you know, North Korea remains uh, still you know, isolated. Okay, finally, uh, what's the future? Uh, I think especially uh, whether Kim Jong-un uh, can you know, survive and consolidate uh, his power. So now uh, Kim Jong-un uh, you know, has been in power uh, for almost two years. Now his main title is the first secretary of the Workers' Party of Korea. But once again here, the name is the Workers' Party, not uh, Communist Party, officially. So once again, uh, in dynastic country like North Korea, uh, three generation succession is, is not unusual. I mean, if you look at, you know, sometimes I compare North Korean succession to Korean Jebel, Korean big business, right? Uh, do you know what is Korean Jebel, right? Like Samsung, you know, LG, Hyundai. They also have pretty much like uh, three generation succession, right? Like Samsung from Lee byung to Lee Gun-hee now, they look like they're you know, you know, giving to uh, Lee Jae-yong. So I think so far, I think going pretty smoothly, in my view. And this is a uh, you know, young leader. And I don't think we know for sure how old he is. There are a little different uh, you know, you know, information. But I think he's like maybe 29 or 30, a very late. 20s. But still there are a lot of uh, uncertainties and, and, and issues, you know, both within the country and without. So if you look at uh, this young leader, uh, until now, I mean, so far, he has been showing in a different style of leadership. You know, he was educated in Switzerland, right? And then he appears very modern and urbane. So, you know, he's you know, willing to be mingled with his soldiers. And uh, yeah, this uh, lady uh, is his wife. And that's also very unusual because uh, either his grandfather or father never uh, took uh, their wife uh, to the public. So in, in, in this society, it's only men, you know. The first lady never appeared you know, publicly, but now, you know, he almost looks like you know, Western you know, leaders. And now, you know this guy, right? <laughs> so, so Rosemann, so I think he went twice, and he just uh, wasn't in North Korea, I think, like a few weeks ago. And now we are wondering, I mean, many experts, why Rosemann, right? <laughs> because, you know, I'm sorry to say this one, but a lot of my colleagues are saying that it's a little embarrassing you know, for America because uh, you know, we have uh, some, someone else that can better represent the uh, uh, United States and you know, why Rosman. And I think the story is that uh, when Kim Jong-un was in Switzerland, I think he was a big fan of Chicago Bulls. Right? I mean, we know that you know, when you know, Georgia and Rosman were playing you know, they have a lot of championship. They are really top team uh, in NBA. So I heard that initially uh, they were trying to invite Michael Jordan, but then he wouldn't go. And then Rosemann, you know, volunteered to go. Now he claims that Kim Jong-un is his you know, best friend. But uh, so he went twice already. So. I think now the question is uh, whether this, this change in style uh, will or can lead to a change in substance in real issue. And there are a lot of signs of you know, change in North Korea, especially a lot of markets. So, you know, he's looking at this market and then look at this, uh, I mean, for North Korean standard, it's a fairly fancy uh, stores and in you know, a cell phones. You know, I heard that this time uh, from China that uh, now they believe that there are about 25, uh, 2.5 million cell phones uh, in North Korea. I was quite surprised because that's about, you know, that means about more than 10% of North Koreans uh, have cell phones. So 
Now, in that sense, uh, North Korea is not as isolated as it used to be. Right? So, uh, whether North Korea will change or can change. So, I guess that that's the title of my talk, and I don't think I gave you an answer. I'm just raising question, right? So, I'm going to stop here, then I'm happy to take any questions.